All right, there we go. Hello, everybody. I'm Michelle Herzog from Los Angeles County Office of Education. And I'm just so thrilled that we have this collaboration with the National Constitution Center. This is our second of a series of webinars that they are putting together for us. And uh, we're very excited to have this one and many more. We hope you sign up for more. We're also contemplating a book deal, right, Carrie? Um, maybe getting some books out to some of you who are participating as well. So keep signing up and keep coming. So thank you to all my new best friends in Philadelphia from National Constitution Center. Thank you all for staying late at the office or at home uh, to put this on for us. Let me turn it over to Carrie Sautner. Carrie, thanks a million. Yeah, this is a great opportunity. Hi, everybody. I'm Carrie Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Center. I'm going to take up one minute of your time. We're excited that with this series, we're able to bring you live from the Constitution Center sneak peeks of the exhibit with nobody else in there. We get to bring you top scholars and because of Michelle's great work, great reading material. So if you have time to read, you'll have even more things to read. So tonight, I'm just going to introduce you to the awesome team that's going to be with you tonight. Number one is Sarah Harris. She is the head of education and doing all the teacher development, and she's overseeing the exchanges as well. So getting a lot of work out there. She'll be guiding you through tonight. But we also have Kevin Lynch, who's one of our top educators, and he gets to walk you through my favorite exhibit at the National Constitution Center, Civil War and Reconstruction. On the backup team, but also the amazing team, Madison, Steele is with us. She's going to help you out in the chat, answer all your questions. And because our team comes in big groups, because we're Philadelphians and we come in groups, is Sheila Edwards. Sheila Edwards is a part of our teacher's advisory board. She's a teacher in California, and she's here to support you with ways that she uses these programs and these materials in her classroom. So I want you to thank you all for coming tonight. And I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Harris and have her lead us through this great program. Fantastic. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Curry. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, as was previously mentioned, my name is Sarah Harris. Um, I've been at the National Constitution Center for almost three years now. Um, and before that, I was a high school history teacher. So I taught freshman history at a high school in Burlington, New Jersey. Um, so I'm so excited to be here today. We're going to talk about um, the 14th Amendment and more specifically defining equal protection. So let me just share my screen with everybody and get this started so we can kind of walk through what the plan for today is. Now, I mentioned this before, and I apologize for those who have been here since, you know, 625 our time and who have heard me say this many, many times already. But you can feel free to unmute your camera and your microphone as much as you are comfortable. I promise you that we will be asking you lots of questions throughout this, this session. We'll be asking for a lot of audience participation, but that participation can come in whatever form you are most comfortable with, whether it's through the chat, as I mentioned, at least one of us will have eyes on it throughout the session, whether it's just unmuting your microphone or going all in and unmuting your camera and your microphone too, totally up to you. Um, but we will be asking for quite a bit of audience participation during our time together today. Um, so this is the session today. We're going to talk, like I said, about defining equal protection. Some of the things that we're going to go over, we're going to introduce ourselves, which we already did. Hello, welcome. Um, we're going to go over the National Constitution Center, just give some background of who we are as an institution and as an education department. Um, as Curry mentioned, Kevin is going to take us on a virtual tour of Civil War and Reconstruction, Battles for Freedom and Equality, and kind of help us build this foundation of the need for the 14th Amendment, um, what kind of historical context surrounded its ratification. We'll then go over one of our um, most prominent resources, the Interactive Constitution, where we have essays about all parts of the uh, Constitution, including the 14th Amendment. Um, and then finally, we'll have time for some questions, some feedback, some ideas on how we can take this all back to the classroom. Um, so that's kind of a general overview of what we have planned for our time together today. As I mentioned before, please do not feel like you are interrupting if you ask questions. Um, you don't need to wait for a pause because I guarantee we will not stop. Um, so just feel free to unmute your microphone or send something through the chat. So the National Constitution Center as a museum was chartered by Congress in 1988. 
The Constitution Heritage Act of 1988 called for a place that was near Independence National Historical Park and a place that disseminated information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. That's it, that's what our, our mission was to do. Um, and so it took us some time to kind of raise the money to open the physical space. And we opened our doors on July 4th, 2003. Why we did July 4th and not September 17th, I can't answer. Um, but needless to say, that's when, when we opened. So we've been open as a museum and this educational resource for the last 17 years. Now, that's kind of a general overview of who we are as an institution. More specifically, who we are as a department comes most directly from our framework for constitutional literacy. So we build these foundations, quite literally, of historical foundations through storytelling. Luckily for us in this kind of age of Zoom, um, we are able to show you what we do in the museum with our historical storytelling. Um, so Kevin is going to use the tour as a way to kind of showcase um, going through and telling these historical foundations through storytelling. We then build on those stories through developing constitutional thinking skills. So how do we apply those historical stories that we all know and love? Um, I met today with um, a group of judges who are helping out with a program that we run. And I mentioned that we all as educators kind of have our favorite stories that we just love to tell. When I was in the classroom, my students would immediately start to roll their eyes and groan whenever they heard me mention a specific person or a specific topic. Um, no longer in the classroom now, my own children bear the brunt of those stories. Um, my son today started, my third grader, poor thing, started a, a unit on the Constitution in class. So dinner was just me peppering him with questions. Um, so that's how we engage though, and that's how we connect with students. Um, and then building on those connections is then applying them to the Constitution, applying them to founding documents, um, and really finding and developing ways to read those and interact with them in a meaningful and engaging way. And then finally, once we accomplish all of those things, we can then ask students to talk about these topics. Sometimes they're quite difficult. Sometimes they're really heavy topics. Um, talking about the 14th Amendment isn't always an easy thing. Um, so as long as we give students those two pieces of that pyramid beforehand, we can then provide them with the tools that they need to have a civil dialogue and finally to reflect on what they think and why they think it. Um, so you'll kind of see as we walk through our session today, all of the components of this framework, hopefully, um, and we'll discuss some ways that you can use these parts of the framework and everything we discussed today back with your students, whether that's in the classroom, whether that's through Zoom or whatever it might be. Now, one of the ways that we accomplish not just our framework, but also the idea that we are a nonpartisan institution is we differentiate between political questions and constitutional questions. So a political question is asking what the government should do. And when you ask this type of question, you're asking students, you're asking citizens, you're asking whomever to rely almost predominantly on their own ideas and feelings. And those ideas and feelings are extremely valid and important to discuss, um, but it's not something that we necessarily work with at the National Constitution Center. We rely, maybe not so surprisingly, on the constitutional question. And this asks what the government may do or what the government can do. And instead of then relying on personal opinions or personal stories, we're asking people instead to look to the Constitution, to look to those founding documents and pieces of legislation so that we can really clearly establish those constitutional ground, groundwork. Um, so this is kind of what those ideas are in theory. In practice, what do they look like? A political question would be, should the federal government increase income taxes? Now, maybe this wouldn't necessarily you know, yield a very heated and passionate debate, but political questions most of the time do. So on the flip side, the constitutional question for that would be, does the federal government have the authority to tax individuals? We know the answer to that question is yes, because of the 16th Amendment. Now, why these are very good examples of political and constitutional questions, if you really do want to have a meaningful and engaging dialogue in your classroom with your students, you're probably not going to ask a yes or no question. 
So here's something that's a little bit more engaging. Political question, should colleges and universities use a quota system in their admissions process? A constitutional question on the flip side, do quota systems used in college admissions processes violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment? Lucky for you, the essays that we have in the interactive constitution deal with these very questions. So we are not only asking these questions, but we're also providing you with the resources that you need to have your students answer them in a way that is civil and respectful. All right, so before we move to the tour, um, okay, good. So I saw some things come through the chat, but I just wanted to make sure that there were any questions that I could help with. Do we have any questions right now before we move into this next section? Anything about who we are as an institution or any part of our educational framework that I can help answer? I'll give everybody a minute. I always forget that wait time on Zoom has to include typing. All right. So I'm going to turn over um, the reins to Kevin, um, who will lead us on about a 45 minute tour of this exhibition space. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is kind of what this framework of the Civil War entails, um, because we'll be discussing some of these ideas later on in our session. Um, so with that, Kevin, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome, everyone. We're so excited that you're able to join us this evening or this afternoon uh, for our tour through uh, one of our most popular and important exhibits that we've had here, uh, Civil War and Reconstruction, uh, the Battle for Freedom and Equality. Uh, and it's an important exhibit to have here because historians and scholars alike have really looked at this period as sort of a second founding, if you will, um, to sort of help further some of the promises of freedom from the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Um, so I'm gonna be taking you through this exhibit and it's sort of divided into three parts. Um, the first section, the room that I'm in now, we examine the story of slavery in America uh, from the period of 1787 and the Constitution signing up until the outbreak of the Civil War. Uh, we then focus on the war years themselves. We have all sorts of artifacts from the Civil War, uh, notably a signed copy of the Emancipation Proclamation from President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and then we conclude with the period of Reconstruction as the nation struggled to rebuild uh, not only physically and socially, uh, but constitutionally as well. So we're really going to highlight the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments and how they helped to reshape the country. Uh, one point that I will just make before we get started, if you haven't done so already, on the top right hand corner of your screen, there is a toggle where you should be able to go between gallery view and speaker view. Uh, gallery view is the, uh, the Brady Bunch view where we can all see everybody. Uh, the speaker view uh, will make the, whoever's speaking, in this case my screen, the tour screen, much bigger. So you'll have a lot clearer view of the wonderful artifacts and significant artifacts uh, that we have to show you today. Um, so we're going to get started. I'm here in the first section. So if I were to sort of pivot over here, uh, this section here, building to crisis and sort of bridging that gap from 1787 and the signing of the Constitution 7, uh, the founders, Washington, Franklin, Hamilton, um, for all of their success in solving many of the problems facing our country's government, uh, coming up with the three different branches, uh, the office of the presidency, separation of powers, they're not quite able to figure out what to do about the institution of slavery. Some of the delegates wanted to do away with it immediately. Others wanted to at least call for an end to the slave trade. Uh, it's worth noting over 20 of the delegates were themselves slave owners. Uh, and one of the great questions in the Constitutional Convention, once they had decided that they were going to at least do part of our government by proportional representation in the House, uh, the question is who exactly is going to count among the population? Um, Southern states arguing that enslaved persons living in their states should count. Uh, Northerners arguing largely that because these people were not given rights, they couldn't vote, they couldn't own property, um, they should not have been counted as citizens. Um, so the compromise, even though slavery, the word itself, is left out of the Constitution, um, the infamous three-fifths 
fifths compromise, uh, counting three fifths of all other persons, uh, would persist into uh, the 19th century. Um, so going forward, we begin to see um, how the compromise is made over the Constitution uh, as the delegates you know, kick the can down the road, so to speak, um, would become more and more the defining issue uh, dividing Americans. So I'm going to pivot over here to this screen, or this map that we have up here, if you can see. Um, this print up here, the was from a census uh, taken in 1860, right on the eve of the Civil War. Uh, and it shows slave holding states uh, in 1860. And we have it broken down sort of by county. Um, so I'll see if I can kind of bring it up over here so you can get an even closer view. And the darker shaded counties are ones that have a greater proportion of enslaved persons living in those states. Um, by the eve of the Civil War, uh, there were at least two states uh, that had more enslaved persons living in their territory uh, than free persons. Um, but if you go back to the original 13 states, um, slavery had been practiced throughout all 13 states, North and South. Um, but as we get around the eve of the Constitution, um, some of the northern states uh, begin to do away with slavery on their own, uh, including Pennsylvania, uh, which in 1780 passed an act of gradual emancipation, uh, where those born after the act had been passed would be freed on, I believe it was their 28th birthday. So the northern states begin to do away with it on their own. So we have an increasing divide in the country between free states in the north and slave states in the south. At the same time, America is beginning to embrace this notion of manifest destiny. This idea that we weren't just going to be 13 states along the eastern seaboard, uh, but it was the country's destiny to expand west and occupy this vast territory from sea to shining sea. Um, but every time we add in a new state, uh, it would begin to upset the balance uh, between free states and slave states, uh, particularly in Congress. So by 1820, uh, a senator from Missouri, or I'm sorry, a senator from Kentucky, was ruling on a case involving the territory of Missouri. Um, so in 1820, the territory of Missouri was petitioning for statehood, and it was decided that Missouri would be added to the Union as a slave state. But to keep the balance, Maine would be added as a free state, and we're going to draw a line across the southern border of Missouri right here. And the notion was any territory added north of that line would be free. Any territory south of that line was open to slavery. And this is the so-called Missouri Compromise uh, that was supposed to hold the nation together. But in the north, the clamor of abolitionists is growing All right, so it looks like um, Kevin's screen may have frozen. Oh, there you go. Kevin, you are back with us. You just froze for just a minute, but you're back. Okay, great. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so we were beginning to show, I was just about to highlight our first artifact of the tour. Um, it's during these years, uh, the 1830s, 40s, um, that we begin to have the activity of the Underground Railroad. Uh, and I have here, um, there wasn't a lot that was recorded about the Underground Railroad. Um, for obvious reasons. It was dangerous keeping records. Um, but there was a man living here in Philadelphia named William Still, uh, the so-called father of the Underground Railroad. And he does keep records uh, of the names of freedom seekers, where they had escaped from, where they were heading next, uh, any new names if they were going to change them. Uh, and he keeps these records to maintain some hope of friends and family being able to reconnect uh, with relatives who may have escaped slavery months or even years uh, after their relatives had. And as you can see here, uh, after the war, Still is in fact able to publish these records. Uh, here is a first edition account from 1872 uh, of William Still's The Underground Railroad. And it remains by far uh, the best first person account of the Underground Railroad. Uh, and we had mentioned earlier the importance of these stories uh, and really making it personable um, of the experience of those fighting slavery. Uh, and from William Stills, The Underground Railroad, we have stories uh, of freedom seekers uh, and their fight to overcome uh, slavery. 
So if we come up over here, um, some of these stories of people, uh, some more famous than others, uh, we highlight a number of individuals on this wall here uh, and even down below. Um, some, perhaps, you know, a, a Frederick Douglass uh, or a Harriet Tubman are well known to us. Um, but we also have the story of a man named Henry Brown over here. Um, who confined himself in a box, uh, roughly, uh, you know, probably not more than about three feet by three feet, pretending to be dried goods, and literally shipped himself to free, uh, supposedly he was uh, to William Still's residence that he arrived. Uh, and after being confined in the box for about 26 hours, uh, he emerges from the box and says to the gathering abolitionists, how do you do, gentlemen, and then collapses from exhaustion. Um, but one of the most important uh, flights against slavery uh, is from these two over here, constitutionally. Uh, we may, many of us may be familiar with the Dred Scott case, um, but Dred was not alone in his fight for freedom. Uh, his wife Harriet also petitioned for her freedom uh, in 1846. The argument was, and this goes back to the Missouri Compromise that we mentioned earlier, um, that any territory north of the southern border of Missouri was to be free territory. Uh, and Dred and Harriet Scott were brought north from Missouri uh, up into what is now present day Minnesota. They're brought into free territory. Uh, and their argument would be that as soon as they went into free territory, um, they should have been free. Um, so they petitioned the court for their freedom. And it would take 11 years before the court would actually rule on their case. Um, but we do have over here, um, we've displayed at various times both Dred and Harriet Scott's actual petition for freedom. And we do have on display for you tonight uh, Harriet Scott's petition uh, from 1846. Let me move my camera over here so it's not glaring as much. Um, so this is Harriet Scott's actual petition to the court for freedom. And it may be difficult to see, um, but all the way down here at the bottom, um, neither Dred nor Harriet uh, could read or write. Um, but you can see maybe um, just make out the X, uh, the mark in which Harriet Scott made her mark uh, in this petition for freedom. So the issue that's brought before the court, and it, it takes until 1857 before the court finally rules, uh, was whether or not Dred and Harriet would be free because they'd been brought into free territory. But the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Taney, uh, goes far beyond the initial ruling of just Dred and Harriet Scott. Taney argued that their case, even bringing it to the court, was invalid, uh, that African Americans were never considered to be citizens by the founding fathers. Uh, and in fact, they had no rights that a white man was bound to respect. Here we have Taney's quote uh, up here behind me. No rights that a white man was bound to respect. Uh, and this issue of whether or not African Americans, free or enslaved, could ever be considered citizens uh, and thus uh, argue their case in court um, would become uh, one of the most uh, difficult flashpoints uh, on the road to civil war. Uh, this decision was intended to solve the issue of slavery once and for all. Uh, they went so far as to rule that the Missouri Compromise was itself unconstitutional. Um, but it has the opposite effect. Uh, and this would be a series of moments that would further accelerate the nation toward war. Um, this is one of the greatest constitutional crises on the eve of the Civil War. So without recourse in the courts, uh, we now move that much faster towards violence. Um, but before we get onto the war itself, I have a series of artifacts that I'd like to show you here in our display case. On the Red War. Um, another of those significant flashpoints was 1852, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's from his Uncle Tom's Cabin. And here we have a first edition print uh, from 1852 um, of Stowe's Cabin. So this literature uh, really sort of brought the notion of slavery into the homes of those um, who may have just heard about it before. It made it much more personal. Uh, and then if we move over here, this is great. Um, for instructing students from a young age to be opposed to slavery. Um, this is the Anti-Slavery Alphabet Children's Book from 1846. Uh, if you can read some over here, uh, A is for an abolitionist, a man who wants to free the wretched slave and give to all an equal liberty. And it goes through, so for each letter, uh, really sort of instilling in young readers, young learners, uh, the importance of opposing the institution of slavery. 
Um, down here, and the kids always get a kick out of this, uh, we have a pike from John Brown's raid. Um, John Brown, of course, was the militant abolitionist uh, whose plan in 1859 was to overthrow slavery um, by creating sort of an armed insurrection. Uh, here we have Brown over here. Uh, of course, Brown's plan uh, does not succeed. Um, he is tried, arrested, and uh, becoming a martyr for those in the North. Um, but this movement again, you know, between those three, uh, Brown's raid, uh, Dred Scott decision, um, Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, really moves the nation that much faster toward war. Ironically, the U.S. colonel uh, who would lead to Brown soon thereafter, of course, manned the Army of Northern Virginia during the war. Now, as we move around the corner here, it is now time to meet Mr. Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln, um, the first and only presidency whose career would be completely defined by war. Uh, and up until this point, Lincoln had been a fairly ordinary uh, Whig politician. Uh, he was a member of the Whig Party, and he had talked about the evils of slavery before, but he wasn't sure whether the government had any authority to do away with slavery in territories where it had existed for several hundred years. Uh, we mentioned that though the word itself is not present in the Constitution, um, there was some thought that it might be protective of slavery in territories where it had existed. But Lincoln always felt that the way to destroy slavery, the way to contain the institution, was to contain it and let it suffocate. So he was always ardently opposed to the expansion of slavery. And if we go back to 1854, uh, there was another one of these flashpoints. So we may be familiar with the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Uh, Stephen Douglas, the senator from Illinois, uh, proposed in 1854 what was known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, at the time, the territories of Kansas and Nebraska were seeking admission to the Union. Uh, and the question was, would they be slave or free? Now, under the old arrangement, the Missouri Compromise, they would have been free territory, as they had been north of the Missouri Compromise line. Douglas was proposing the notion of popular sovereignty, this idea that we shouldn't have a binding compromise on this. States should have simply a referendum and decide for themselves whether they wanted to have slavery or not. Uh, and the immediate effect of this act is a rush of pro and anti-slavery settlers into the Kansas territory, uh, which erupts into bleeding Kansas when they literally begin fighting it out. Lincoln is so angered by the Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, that it brings him into politics, and he helps to form a brand new political party dedicated to halting the expansion of slavery. And this is, in fact, the birth of the modern Republican Party. Now, there's a few artifacts I want to show you here relating to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, over here, we have a plaster cast of Lincoln's hands. And this was from 1861, shortly after he assumes the presidency. Uh, and you'll note that one of these hands here, he has a broom handle. Uh, Lincoln had shook so many hands that day that when he posed for the mold, his hand shook so much uh, that he needed to hold a broom handle simply to keep his hands steady enough. And here we have a wood carving. Uh, we'll see if we can kind of zoom in on this, um, of Abraham Lincoln raising a flag. And that flag raising took place right across the street at Independence Hall. Abraham Lincoln had grown up revering the founding fathers and the idea of declaration uh, of independence and uh, democracy and the government that they helped to create. And as Lincoln is raising the flag, and we have portions of the flag right over here behind me, Lincoln gives the speech in front of the crowd of Independence Hall, and he remarks that I would rather be assassinated on this spot than to surrender the principles of freedom and equality in the Declaration of Independence. So Lincoln's election would then precipitate uh, the secession of the Southern states. Um, South Carolina was the first state to secede. Uh, around here, we actually have uh, an original ordinance from South Carolina as they were the first state to leave. Um, within a month and a half, six more states- I would joined. prefer not to. <laughs> what was the question? I don't know, Kevin. I I, I yeah. heard something too, but That's I don't know if somebody. Tanya, do you have a question? Good. I'm not good at notes. All right. Okay. 
Okay, well, if you do have a question, please let me know. I'll be more than happy to try to answer. But it's ultimately 11 states total um, that would secede from the union. Uh, they elect Jefferson Davis as their own president, uh, and they write up their own constitution, uh, which you can see down here, um, which aside from mentioning the significance of states' rights uh, and the institution of slavery, um, was actually in some aspects very similar to the United States Constitution. The actual violence of the war would begin in April 1861 with the shelling of Fort Sumter. Um, and during the shelling there, the Confederate general was named Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, who had previously attended West Point and had received high praise as an artillery officer. His teacher at West Point was a man named Robert Anderson, who now commanded the fort that Beauregard was shelling. So illustrating that this war was going to be very much- I uh, teach up elementary third grade right now. That's great, thank you so much. Very nice. Uh, very much going to be friend against friend, brother against brother, um, friend against foe. Um, now, as we move here into the war years, um, we're going to sort of jump ahead to sort of the halfway point and one of the most significant artifacts that we have on display here, uh, and one that will be important to us as we move forward in talking about uh, the 14th Amendment. Here we have our version of the Emancipation Proclamation. Not the original that Abraham Lincoln signed uh, and went into effect on January 1st, 1863, but one of 47 copies that was signed here and auctioned off in Philadelphia the next year to raise money for the war effort. Signed by Abraham Lincoln and his Secretary of State, William Seward, and these sold for $10 apiece in 1864, roughly a month's salary for a Civil War soldier. But it is, of course, with the Emancipation Proclamation that we have a turning point in the war. Up until this point, for the first two years or so of the war, the stated war aim of Abraham Lincoln and the North was preservation of the Union. Lincoln had talked about, if I could save the Union without freeing anybody, I would do that. If I could save the Union by freeing some and leaving others in bondage, I would do that too. But as the war progresses and the casualties mount up, uh, and ultimately more Americans would be killed during the Civil War than all other wars combined, it brings Abraham Lincoln to believe um, that this cause um, cannot just be about preservation of the old Union as it was. Uh, his house divided against itself cannot stand. Uh, it can't just be about shoring up the old house. Um, there needs to be a higher cause for this. Uh, and by early 1863, he had come around to the belief uh, that that higher cause was emancipation. So going okay. forward now, that war, I, um, and not everyone agreed. Day, we're actually doing a big project in our books for language arts and a massive project, but I've broken it down into multiple steps in the project. So it is working, especially in this forum. So it That's is great. Working. We're doing the Lucy Calkins versions of it because kids at that age can't stay with the project for a long time. So we're just, I broke in, we're doing nonfiction. So we're just doing it chapter by chapter over a big topic that we're learning about different things. In each chapter, we're working on different convections. So that's- Very nice, it sounds great. We're working it into a bigger project for project-based. That's great, I'm glad it's working out well. I went with it. Great. So as we move forward here, one of the major turning points um, in union policy from the Emancipation Proclamation um, is actually uh, having African-Americans enlist in the war effort themselves. So some of these artifacts that we have over here, if I can spotlight, um, Frederick Douglass had long advocated for African-American soldiers to be allowed to fight for their own cause, their own freedom. Uh, and here we have a pass that was carried by Frederick Douglass uh, as he traveled to recruit union troops during 1863. And here we have an early training manual. Um, and you'll note though, um, while uh, African-Americans are able now to serve in the war, um, you might be able to see on the side here, um, the title of this book was US Tactics for Colored Troops. Um, so even though we have this step of allowing them to fight, um, we do already see here instances of segregation. Um, and again, figuring out equality um, and desegregation will become a theme moving forward later on. So let me here show you sort of our uh, Civil War buffs case here, uh, those who come to 
look at the Civil War uh, to love this case. We've got everything from the flags, the uniforms. Um, we actually have a piece of Civil War era food, believe it or not. Um, up here we have a piece of hardtack. Uh, this would have been stale back in 1862, and I assure you it's probably still stale today. Um, we've got flags, we've got letters. Um, down here we have a Civil War surgeon's kit. Um, medical care in that era was relatively uh, horrific uh, by any standards. Um, there's a story of a Union general named Daniel Sickles, uh, who had lost his leg after the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, seemingly not concerned, he has his leg donated to a medical college in Washington, uh, where you can still see the remnants of the leg today. And if I can borrow the joke from the tour guide at Gettysburg, um, to this day, it remains General Sickles' legacy. Ah, that's funny. <laughs> but as we move here now towards the end of the war and getting into the era of Reconstruction, um, before we close the book on the war, I would like to introduce a few of the key players in Congress that would help lead the fight for Reconstruction. Uh, up over here, we have Thaddeus Stevens, uh, a leader of the House of Representatives. Highlight him over here from our own Pennsylvania. And then his colleague in the Senate, Charles Sumner. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln's did not do away with slavery in its entirety. Uh, in fact, it only applied to states that were currently under rebellion. So border states uh, like a Kentucky, a Missouri, Delaware, Maryland, um, they were not affected by the Emancipation Proclamation. And this was seen as a war measure. Um, and people were beginning to question whether or not this would be effective once the war was over. So people like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, though, their vision of Reconstruction went well beyond simply emancipation. Uh, they looked to punish the southern states for the cause of the war, um, and they looked to extend equal rights, um, perhaps even the right to vote, um, to formerly enslaved African Americans. Uh, and this was a very far-reaching division. Uh, I have here a note from Charles Sumner. Uh, if I can kind of pull this up down over here. This is a note from Charles Sumner. Um, he is the same Charles Sumner of the famous uh, Sumner Brooks incident, um, where he was nearly beaten to death on the Senate floor um, for his attacks against a pro-slavery congressman. Um, but Sumner was one of the most advocate, uh, staunchest advocates um, for freedom for formerly enslaved African Americans. And this note over here, freedom always for all. So this notion here shows that the Republicans in Congress, these so-called radical Republicans, um, are looking to move far beyond just emancipation. Uh, and their vision of Reconstruction would contrast sharply uh, with the opinions of the man in the White House. So let us move over here and close out the war. April 9th, 1865, Robert E. Lee finally surrenders his Army of Northern Virginia to General Ulysses S. Grant. So the war is very nearly over. But the Union has less than one week to celebrate uh, in this surrender, because on April 14th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln is assassinated at Ford's Theater by the actor and Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth. What is less known was that Lincoln wasn't the only target that evening. Uh, Booth had co-conspirators who were supposed to assassinate uh, the Secretary of State William Seward, General Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, Grant and his wife actually had tickets to attend the play at Ford's Theater that evening. We actually have a playbill. Yes, what was that? We actually have the playbill right up over here. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, I was going to say they were in Burlington, New Jersey, which is where I'm from. Very nice. There we are. Mm -hmm. I'm very Those proud of being from New Jersey. <laughs> very nice. Here we have the, uh, the playbill uh, that evening from uh, our American cousin at Ford Studer uh, that Grant was supposed to have attended, um, but he bows out at the last minute. Uh, supposedly, uh, Mrs. Grant and Mrs. Lincoln did not get along. The fourth uh, member of uh, Booth's hit list that evening was the vice president, Andrew Johnson. Johnson was a Southerner um, by birth and at heart. Uh, and he had been picked as Lincoln's running mate in 1864, um, merely to broaden the ticket's appeal. Um, Johnson, the man who was signed by Booth to assassinate Johnson, uh, lost his nerve. 
started drinking, decided he wasn't going to go through with it. So when Johnson wakes up the next morning, he becomes the first person to become president by virtue of assassination. Now, his vision of Reconstruction was far different from those in Congress. Um, Johnson thought that the Southern states should come back to the Union fairly easily. Uh, he's okay and even advocates former Confederates resuming their seats in Congress. And above all, Johnston really doesn't see a need to change the nature of the relationship between whites and blacks in this country. So the resulting conflict over reconstruction policy between the president and members of Congress would result in the largest number of presidential vetoes, a record at the time, the largest number of congressional overturns of presidential vetoes, a record that still stands, and the first ever presidential impeachment. Johnson would become the first president to be impeached and would in fact survive his Senate trial and removal from office by one vote. And we're gonna see one of those vetoes in a moment. Um, so we come up over here. Uh, Abraham Lincoln did live to see the 13th Amendment uh, ratified by Congress. Uh, if any of you saw the uh, Daniel Day-Lewis movie a few years ago. Um, so the 13th Amendment makes its way out of Congress and by December of 1865, it is ratified. So the 13th Amendment here is the one that does what the Emancipation Proclamation um, perhaps couldn't do. Uh, abolishing slavery in the United States. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude uh, is allowed in the United States. Uh, here we have our certified copy of the 13th Amendment signed by Secretary of State w William Seward, uh, who did survive his assassination attempt that evening. Um, but now that we have the 13th Amendment uh, abolishing slavery, uh, it now becomes a question of what exactly is the status um, of those who had been previously held in bondage? Uh, are they in fact citizens? Do they have rights? Um, and in the South, we begin to see immediately um, what could be perhaps best characterized as slavery in another name. Uh, African Americans in the Southern states um, were largely not able to operate their own businesses. Um, and the Southern states instituted a series of uh, what were called black codes um, to keep them uh, in the most adjunct uh, poverty uh, and in dependence on um, the landowners whom they would work. Um, so if we come around here, uh, and this gets into why we needed to expand, why the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, um, wasn't enough, why we need to amend the Constitution further. Uh, here we actually have a series uh, or a document of South Carolinian Constitution Black Codes, um, which would limit African Americans uh, and the way that they're actually able to live. It doesn't really give them much in the way uh, of rights as a citizen. So in response, Congress meets, and in 1866, determined to fight back against President Johnson, they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Here we have up here. And this act was intended to combat the Black Codes uh, and would extend rights of citizenship to African Americans. But we think of this act really in the same manner as the Emancipation Proclamation. How binding was this document? Like the Emancipation Proclamation, could it hold up? Could it be overturned, depending on the nature of the Congress or the will of the people? How far did this document actually go? This was, in fact, one of President Johnson's 29 vetoes, although it would be overturned by Congress. And Johnson was arguing largely that the Congress didn't have the constitutionality to impose such a document. So to ensure that the rights of African Americans protected in the Civil Rights Act of 1866, uh, we now have the 14th Amendment. Uh, so if we come up over here, we have our certified version of the 14th Amendment. And there's really sort of three major clauses uh, that we have in the 14th Amendment. So if we come up over here, we can see. So the 14th Amendment would clarify exactly who was a citizen. Uh, and then there's sort of like three major clauses within this uh, amendment. We've got the privileges and immunities clause. We have the due process clause and the equal protection clause, um, which in effect stated that people as citizens, who exactly was a citizen, would have equal protection under the law. So this was the, the amendment that was supposed to give the Civil Rights Act of 1866 sort of the, the backbone. It was intended, and this we're going to say today, um, to protect African-Americans and to give them the rights of citizenship. 
But we see here with this amendment, uh, it goes further than that. And this will be interpreted later, um, not just to protect the rights of African Americans, um, but to protect those um, of different minorities, of different groups. Uh, and even as early as the passage of the 14th Amendment uh, in 1868, um, we see women using the 14th Amendment uh, to advocate that they should have rights, particularly the right to vote. So buried amongst the 14th Amendment, and it's one of the longest of our amendments, there is a line, an infamous line up here. I don't know if we'll be able to zoom in close enough. Um, but in section two of the 14th Amendment, um, we have mentioned where um, it's going to be punishment to states um, where if they abridge, um, let's see, where do we have over here? Yes. Um, if the rights in the legislature is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state being 21 years of age. So there we have the first time that in the Constitution, the reference of gender is included. Uh, and women here who have been arguing that the 14th Amendment gave them citizenship, and no one was arguing that, um, but that being a citizen didn't necessarily, as the court would argue, uh, grant them the right to vote. So as we see here, as we move up into the 15th Amendment, um, this really does begin to sort of split uh, the women's suffrage movement, which for so long had worked together with the abolition movement um, for these great causes uh, of liberty and rights. So let's sort of come around over here to 1868 after the passage of the 14th Amendment. And of all the artifacts that we have on display in here, um, one of the most important uh, is actually one of the most shabby looking. Down here, I have what used to be a cereal box. This green object here, uh, if uh, you look on the back, there's still a label here for concentrated Jamaica ginger. But by 1868, this had been repurposed as a ballot box. And you can see on the top over here. And this would have caught some of the first legal votes of African Americans uh, in the southern states. In 1868, largely because of the protections of the Civil Rights Act and the 14th Amendment, African Americans are able to participate for the first time in a presidential election, uh, and they vote almost to a man for General Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, Grant would win the popular vote that year. Um, well, there were about 500,000 African Americans who voted, and Grant would win the popular vote by 300,000. So Grant is, in fact, the first president to win without winning the majority of the white vote. As we move forward uh, for Grant's second term, here we have the most famous attempt, perhaps, uh, in Susan B. Anthony's storied career to grant women the right to vote. Grant is running in 1872, and Susan B. Anthony attempts to cast her ballot. She is arrested and fined $100 for illegal voting. And her arguments here uh, and the division of the women's suffrage movement largely spans from the 15th Amendment. With African Americans now voting, um, there's efforts of the southern states largely um, to combat their suffrage. Um, poll taxes, literacy tests, um, terrorist groups like the Klan um, to keep them from voting. Um, and as we move forward here into 1870, we have our last of the three Reconstruction Amendments, uh, and that is the 15th. Uh, and the text of the 15th Amendment states um, that the rights of citizens to vote shall not be denied on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And the courts would later interpret this to mean that this would extend the right to vote to African-American men, but not necessarily to women. And this does sever uh, the leadership of the women's suffrage movement. Uh, over here, we have Lucy Stone, um, who argued she had a spirited debate with Frederick Douglass uh, in 1868 um, about who needed the right to vote more, whether the woman or the African-American man. Um, she ultimately, though, although she believed that women needed the right to vote, she would support the 15th Amendment. Um, but people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony um, argued that this amendment should be changed or at least tweaked to grant women the right to vote, as well as African-American men. So that amendment would sort of sever uh, the women's suffrage movement. And of course, it would be another 50 years before women would be granted the right to vote. Uh, and that, of course, this year, uh, we have another exhibit on that celebrating the centenary of the 19th Amendment. 
So as we move up over here, we've got a few minutes left to go. Um, and we're sort of left with assessing the legacy of Reconstruction. Uh, 1877, um, presidential election, and the Republican nominee, Rutherford Hayes, it's a very contested election. Uh, it's one of several where um, the popular vote went to one candidate, while the winner ended up being of the minority. Uh, Republican Rutherford Hayes um, ends up becoming the president in 1877. Um, and Democratic opposition evaporates sort of at the end of the candidacy. Um, and Hayes then immediately moves to pull the plug on the troops in the southern states um, that are advocating the policies of reconstruction. So this becomes sort of the, uh, the great compromise, if you will, uh, where it was alleged that the president made concessions to get to the White House in exchange for ending reconstruction in the southern states. Um, so 1877 is often cited as the end, really, of active efforts uh, of the United States government um, to enforce Reconstruction policies in the southern states. And what we have here is a rollback of rights, uh, and the courts really begin to argue over these amendments, particularly the 14th Amendment. Um, so some of these uh, famous Supreme Court cases in American history that we're familiar with, um, we have a list of some of them over here, um, but most notably, perhaps, um, you know, 1896 is Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, and then 1954 is Brown versus Board of Education. All of these rights here um, that are argued about in court cases, many of them pertain to the Equal Protection Clause uh, in the 14th Amendment. Just who exactly had the rights, equal protection under the laws? Uh, in 1896, the court rules that, well, if we separate people and the institutions are equal, then that's okay. It's not infringing on your rights under the 14th Amendment. The court's decision by 1854 had changed and they unanimously overturned that. Um, so when we look at sort of the complicated legacy of Reconstruction, um, certainly uh, the policies didn't go as far um, as people would have perhaps wanted. Um, and there's argument about, you know, if Lincoln had lived, may it have been different. If the courts had gone farther, it would have been different. Um, but we are left with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Uh, and these amendments um, are never taken off the books. We've had one amendment that has been repealed, uh, and it hasn't been one of these three. Um, and the 14th Amendment particularly uh, continues to be argued about today. Uh, it was initially intended to grant African Americans who had been previously enslaved the rights of citizenship. Um, but that's been extended, and we continue to look at now, um, whether it's women's rights, whether it's immigrants' rights, um, currently whether or not you know, rights for those of uh, different sexual orientations. You know, all of these different groups have used the 14th Amendment um, to argue for their equal protection under the law. Um, so these amendments, um, and though their relationship and history in the courtroom um, has been rocky at some instances, um, we continue to use them and they continue to be um, one of the most important arguments uh, in the ever ongoing cause um, for rights in America. Um, so with that, we've sort of wrapped up our tour of our Civil War and Reconstruction exhibit. Um, if anyone has any questions at all about anything that we've covered over here, um, please don't hesitate to ask. I want to thank you all so very much for your time. Um, and so I'll stick around for a few more moments, um, but I'll turn it back over to Sarah so you can continue on with your program. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and as Kevin said, we can kind of give everybody a moment to either gather their thoughts to ask a question or to type their question into the chat because um, I know that can take some time. But Kevin, thank you so much for that wonderful tour and great overview that will uh, give us some of the historical foundations that we need. Um, so you're getting thank you. That was wonderful. Sheila's clapping. Um, but Kevin, um, if we do have any questions that do come in, we will be sure, I mean, we know where you work, so we'll be sure to pass them along to you. Um, but again, thank you so much for giving us uh, that kind of historical foundation that we needed. Thank you all so very much. Okay, so as we kind of move from that component of our framework, um, I'm going to once again share my screen um, to go back to the um, presentation for today. Okay. So these are the questions that I shared. We're going to address them again as we go through some of our, um, some, we go through our interactive constitution essays. Um, but they were just one that I wanted you guys to keep in mind as we went through the tour as part of the information that Kevin shared with us, we'll be able to answer some of those questions as well. All right, so let's backtrack just a little bit. 
Um, so I mentioned before that we have what we call our interactive constitution. So this is a collection of um, essays uh, about different parts of the constitution itself. Um, so every single clause amendment um, article in the constitution has about three essays. So what we did is we collected the um, kind of leading constitutional scholars about uh, their specific topic um, and asked them to write these essays for the interactive constitution. So we partnered them up based off of their areas of expertise and kind of depending on their political and philosophical ideologies. Um, and we said, first and foremost, you both need to sit down together and write an essay on all of the areas regarding that piece of the constitution on which you agree. You have to do that first and foremost. After they get that essay written, then they could separate and write their independent essays about all of the areas that they did not necessarily agree upon. So this is a really great nonpartisan um, resource that you can use when you're talking about some of these really big constitutional topics. Um, and we're today are going to read the um, common interpretation essay. And the really nice thing to keep in mind as we go through this is even though as Kevin mentioned at the end of his tour, in modern day, we've used the 14th Amendment to guarantee rights for a myriad of groups of people. Um, sometimes, you know, there's people who agree and disagree with those, with those, um, excuse me, Supreme Court decisions. But you know that reading this common interpretation essay are all areas that these leading constitutional scholars agree on. Um, so. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen. I apologize if I'm making anybody um, motion sick, um, but let me get the um, copy of the essay that I have for everybody. I'm going to put it in the chat and hopefully if I did everything right, this will ask you to create your own copy of this essay. Um, so that way you can kind of type on it, um, highlight things, whatever you would like as you kind of take some time to read through it today. So if somebody wouldn't mind just clicking on that and making sure that it asks you to make a copy um, and that I did that correct so that everybody can have access to this essay. Sheila, thank you so much. So when we um, had the interactive constitution, when we created it, when we were asking scholars to make these essays, we said to them, for, first and foremost, these need to be written on a high school reading level. Scholars said, okay, they did their part, they wrote their essays. When we got the essays back and read, or excuse me, ran them through a readability scale, they came back at a grade like 13 and a half. So needless to say, some of these essays aren't necessarily written at a high school reading level. Some of them are a little bit more advanced. What you will find though, when you go into that common interpretation essay of the Equal Protection Clause, you'll see that it's about a page and a half maybe, and that's kind of with the annotation on the side. So this is a really, really accessible essay for an issue that can be really difficult for students to grapple with. So first and foremost, what I'm going to ask everybody to do is just take a couple of minutes um, and kind of read through that essay. Again, please feel free to take notes on the side, to highlight things, whatever you would like, whatever helps you kind of identify some of the key points. The second link that I just sent into the chat is an interactive note. Um, so this is something that everyone will have access to and can kind of type in some of the um, answers to the questions that I showed um, before and that I shared before our tour with Kevin. So again, if somebody can click on that and make sure it looks like everybody's entering in. So these interactive notes are ones that everybody will be able to see what you're typing because they're interactive notes. Um, but it's a nice way to kind of engage students that might be working virtually um, or to kind of do group work. I did a session um, a couple of weeks ago for about 150 teachers um, and broke them into breakout rooms and had each breakout room have their own set of interactive notes. So all of those teachers as they were reading for, oh, thank you, Sheila. Um, all of those, as all of those teachers were, um, you know, going through everything and um, making, reading through the essays and things like that, um, they were able to collaborate and take notes even though they weren't right next to each other. I should have just changed that setting. So if again, somebody can check that for me, that would be wonderful. Um, but in the meantime, what I'm going to do is just take a minute or two 
probably closer to like 10 or 15, um, to read that common interpretation essay. In that interactive notes sheet, take anything you gleaned from the essay itself, anything that Kevin shared with us to answer some of those questions, and then to insert any of the questions that you might have, or any of those questions that you would want to additionally ask your students. Um, so Sheila just said through the chat that you might need to refresh it. Somebody was typing in there, which I, I'm hoping was just to indicate that it was working. So I appreciate it. Um, thank you everybody for, for testing out my tech skills. Um, but like I said, what I'm going to do is just kind of be quiet for about 10 minutes. If you wanna read through that essay, do some of those interactive notes, and then we will have a conversation about that in, at, at 7.45. Um, so we'll talk either through the chat or, or verbally if people want to unmute their microphones. Um, but any questions, I will still be here. I'm not going anywhere in that 10 minutes. Um, just let me know. But please feel free to go through that essay.
just one more minute to finish up whatever section you're working on or whatever question you're answering, and then we'll get started to talk about everything. All right, so it looks like a couple of people are just finishing some things up in the in the interactive notes. Um, thank you everyone who took the time to answer those questions. And again, feel free to just kind of answer my questions in the chat, but what were our, some of our reactions about reading this essay? What were some words that we wrote down or sections that we highlighted? Um, just kind of something that surprised us, anything upon reading this presumably for the first time or, you know, again, after a while? What are some things that stuck out to us? I know that I, what I wrote down was supplemented quite nicely with what Kevin shared with us during the tour. Um, and there were a lot of things that when I kind of went back to look over my notes that were put into a little bit more context, given some of those uh, stories that Kevin shared with us um, in the tour today, which was really nice to make those connections. Um, looking at the, uh, the interactive notes, we see that some people talked about um, modern interpretations of the Equal Protection Clause being a legacy of, the, of Reconstruction, how originally it was intended to ensure equal treatment um, of African Americans or the formerly enslaved, but now it's expanded to include other groups and protecting them. Um, talking about a, a, the, the Wong Kim Ark case and including a link you know that you're in a session with a group of teachers when they provide a citation for what they said. That's very impressive. Um, that's awesome. Um, some of the constitutional crises before and after the Civil War that shaped Reconstruction, people mentioned the Missouri Compromise, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Dred and Harriet Scott. It's so nice to see those two names together and to kind of give Harriet the credit that she is due in that whole entire process. Um, so I highly encourage everybody to do a little bit more research about her as well, because she's a fascinating study. The Three-Fifths Clause, the Fugitive Slaves Clause, Haze of Rolling Back the Rights. That's one of the things, um, knowing kind of the spoilers and knowing what questions were going to come when Kevin mentioned that rolling back of Reconstruction and all of the successes were, that were happening um, during Reconstruction in terms of African Americans serving in the government in numbers that had never been seen before and took a very long time to be seen again, um, how successful that was um, and kind of how taking troops out of the South really was a detriment to that whole entire process, um, which is a, a great response to that. Um, so modern debates about the Equal Protection Clause or same-sex marriage in the Burgerfeld, which is wonderful. What types of classifications are suspect um, in light of the history of the Equal Protection Clause? And then some other questions about what you might ask your students. So does it protect citizen from, citizens from unequal laws from the state, federal government, or both? And how does it apply to um, citizens who are people who are citizens of the United States of America um, and people who are not citizens um, or people whose um, citizenship status is maybe in flux. Um, Tanya said that the Underground Railroad aid, um, oh, enabling their voices in America, that was a very, very amazing part too um, when Kevin showed us that um, kind of record that William still kept, which was wonderful. Um, so 
The two essays that I also shared with everybody, and as I mentioned in the chat as well, I'm going to kind of share a whole folder of all of this with you after, kind of in the follow-up emails as well. But the two other essays that come along with this common interpretation essay deal primarily with, um, with quotas, with the quota systems in colleges and universities. So you'll get kind of dueling opinions about the status of those and kind of how they should be used, how they should be interpreted by the law. Um, one of my favorite parts of these essays is the last sentence of this one. Like many constitutional provisions, the Equal Protection Clause continues to be in flux. If there is no less kind of satisfying ending to an essay about something that you just really want answers to. But a lot of the, um, some of these other uh, matters of debate essays kind of end the same way. Um, so I would highly encourage you to look at some of these other uh, essays that go along with the Equal Protection Clause as well. As like I said, they will give you kind of multiple perspectives in a way that build off of this common interpretation essay very, very nicely. Um, so as we kind of have our final 10 minutes, I want to make sure that I leave some time for um, questions if we have any questions as well. Um, but let's go back to presentation. All right, so we talked about, um, we answered some of these questions. And again, we know that these are all kind of formulated in a way that is constitutional. These are all constitutional questions. So if we were to share these questions with our students, we would be asking them to go to the Constitution, go to the stories that were told in class, or go to these interactive constitution essays to find some of these answers, um, which will shape a very kind of fruitful and civil dialogue that could follow. So some other online resources that we can provide to you so that you can bring some of these materials back into your classroom. We have the interactive constitution as you've seen. Um, I'll just kind of show you real quick what that looks like. Um, just so you can see how to navigate it. So if you go to our website and click on Interactive Constitution, you're taken to this, this page where you can quite literally scroll through the articles. Um, you can scroll through the amendments. Um, so going to, for our purposes, the 14th Amendment, you'll find the different sections that Kevin talked about. Here, the word, word male is um, enshrined in the Constitution, just like Kevin mentioned. Um, and you'll be able to find all of these clauses here where you can then find the essays. Um, so it's a really, really helpful tool um, to be able to, like I said, find kind of nonpartisan resources. You can also click on this media library, which will give you a searchable collection of all of our resources about any specific topic. So if we want to type in 14th Amendment and hit search, it will give you the results of any podcast, any video, any blog post or educational video surrounding the 14th Amendment. So you'll be able to find any kind of material that you're looking for through any kind of medium um, that would be helpful to you to share to your students, to share with your students, excuse me. As I mentioned before, the interactive constitution essays are at times written at a higher reading level than most high school students can easily kind of accomplish on their own. Um, we try to provide supports necessary to make it accessible to students at all reading levels. But in addition to that, we also have our blog, which is written at an eighth grade reading level. So this has different posts. As you can see, sometimes it's kind of this day in history. Sometimes it's about current events. Um, but that's a really accessible resource to use as well as you kind of share this material with your students. Okay, in addition to the interactive constitution and our media library, we also have a couple of online interactives. This one on the left, Writing Right, um, traces the source materials that James Madison used when he um, wrote the Bill of Rights. So you can see kind of where he kind of found some of his inspiration for these rights. You know, I'm just gonna show you this too. Um, so as you go through it, you'll see the first sentence. Um, you'll see kind of everything that Madison used and kind of used as his historical sources for formulating the First Amendment. You can also click on it and it will compare the source language to the amendment itself, to the final kind of draft of that amendment. So you'll be able to compare and contrast it also shows you how much of the text 
between the two are kind of legal matches, how much they have in common. You'll then be able to trace the proposals as they went through the House, through the Senate, and then finally as they were ratified. So I like this a resource for a multitude of reasons, um, but when I interact with students, what I really like is it shows students that something doesn't come from nothing, um, that Madison had to use kind of these sources to help him create what would become the Bill of Rights, but it also shows students that what was kind of handed in, what was the final copy of something, was by no means the first copy. So we're seeing these kind of edits taking place, these changes being made until something emerges as the um, Bill of Rights that we know today. One interesting thing that I will point out is in addition to the 10 amendments, there's also amendments not adopted. So there's a couple of proposals here. The one that I'm going to draw everybody's attention to is Madison's proposal 14, which says no state shall violate the equal rights of conscience or the freedom of the press or the trial by jury in criminal cases. These were rights that James Madison thought were so sacred that he thought that we should incorporate them at the time of the founding. So it would later be some issues and some rights that are enshrined in what would become the 14th Amendment, this kind of incorporation of these rights into state governments was this 14th proposal that Madison proposed before the Bill of Rights were ratified. Um, so that's kind of something interesting to look at as well. In addition to that, we also have the rights around the world. Um, this looks at the rights that are explicitly enshrined in our constitution and compares what other countries also have that rights enshrined in their founding documents or constitution. So if we look at due process, actually let's look at equality before the law. So you'll be able to see kind of what the language uh, in our constitution says. And then you will be able to see all of the other countries that also have something that guarantees equality before the law in their constitutions as well. So if you have any kind of geography requirement, this is a tool that will be helpful in that regard. Um, you can also um, click on a country itself and that'll kind of show you some of the um, rights that that country has and how it compares to, um, to the United States. You can go through any of these rights, including the freedom of expression, um, the freedom of, of press. We normally do this with the First Amendment as it's just a really clear representation of what other countries have um, enshrined in their own founding documents and constitutions as well. In addition to this, as Madison mentioned before, we also have a new exhibition called the 19th Amendment, How Women Won the Right to Vote. Um, and this we do virtual tours for but we also have some online interactives associated with them. This one called The Awakening will trace the country, or excuse me, the states across the United States that um, gave women or didn't give women the right to vote before the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So you'll be able to kind of literally go through time and it will highlight the states as they give or retract uh, suffrage for women. It will also highlight the type of suffrage that women had. Maybe it was full suffrage. Maybe women could only vote in local elections like the school board. Um, but as you kind of move through time, it will show you what those rights looked like. If you click on the individual state, it will also just give you a little bit of background about what that state did in regards to women's suffrage. So for instance, for California, it tells you about when women started to run for political office after they gained the right to vote. Finally, you can click on the text of the amendment itself and get some of the primary sources associated with this um, resource. So it's a really helpful tool when you're kind of comparing this idea of federalism in regards to women's suffrage. The debate highlights just that. It highlights the debates around women's suffrage. I like this resource a lot because it will show you both sides of the argument. You can also click to listen to an actor reading some of these arguments out loud. So you're getting a little bit of different types of learning styles in this. Um, so it will also kind of give you information about the cartoon that is used, which again incorporates some of those primary source materials. But you can click on 
a variety of these topics and it will give you the arguments that support or that went against women's suffrage in regards to whatever that topic is that it's, that it's highlighting. So it's another really useful online interactive that will give you primary sources and secondary sources and some interactive multimedia materials. Okay, so I'm going to share all of this with you afterwards. Um, the kind of part of our framework that we didn't necessarily get to is the civil dialogue and reflection. We have this video clip of when Justice Breyer came to the National Constitution Center and talked about what civil dialogue looks, looks like in the Supreme Court. It's something that I would use every single day in my class if I were still in the classroom. It's about four and a half minutes long. I could probably um, kind of recite it just from memory, but it's a fantastic way to establish any type of civil dialogue that you choose to have in your classroom. We have some other opportunities to work with us as well. Um, as Michelle mentioned in the beginning of our session, we do have more of these kind of scattered throughout the rest of the school year. Um, they're every single month. So please feel free to sign up for some more of these sessions. Um, they're all different topics and we will kind of highlight more of our exhibition spaces as well as have some scholars come in and talk about some of these topics as well. As Curry mentioned, one of the programs that I work on is the scholar exchanges, and this will provide students the opportunity to listen to a scholar and hear questions from students from across the country. We have both open source public scholar exchanges, which are held every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, as well as private exchanges, which are held on Tuesday and Thursday and are scheduled at a time that is convenient for your schedule. If you would like any more information about that, or anything else that we shared with you today, please feel free to email us and let us know. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now. Um, and that way I can kind of send some of our email addresses. I know that I'm at time, um, but I wanna make sure, and I will happily stick around if everybody needs to go. Um, I wanna make sure that I respect your time as well. But I wanna thank everybody for being here. Um, you are all going through a very, very difficult and very weird school year and I appreciate you taking the time out of your day amidst all of that to try to learn new resources that you can take back to your students, which I think is beyond admirable. Um, so I'm going to stop recording because I often forget to